Uh, let me start with, so um, Kishore, uh, Nepal Research Center and its uh, Malin Policy Research Consortium welcomes you. This is the 16th year in the running. And you'll be the, you are the first, thank you for being the first guest uh, for this uh, Feed the Mind workshop series we started. And what we are trying to do is to kind of bring people like you and then have you share your experience in different fields so that our young audience, as you said, would uh, learn from people like you. And the topic that you chose or we invited to, uh, uh, you to give a talk on had to do with the academic career, how to succeed and uh, various facets in it. So, um, this crowd that you will you are facing is a team of scholars with interest in the Himalayan region in terms of the research, Asia, right? Uh, but they come from China, Nepal, India, North America, Bangladesh, and so it's a very international crowd, but with interdisciplinary uh, interests. So there are political science, economists, uh, and you know, like health, public economics and all that, right? Some of the grad student postdoc, as well as uh, lots of junior faculty. So they will, they will learn a lot from you, we expecting. And, the, and before I move on to introduce you, a little um, sort of a ground rule. So it's gonna be about 50 to 55 minutes uh, of our conversation. And, and then, then we open the chat line where my uh, co-moderator, Dr. Adhikari and uh, Dr. Wong will join in for 30 minutes to bring all the other questions that might arise, right, during the conversation. And then at the end, uh, our uh, Dr. Mahmoud will kind of wrap it up a couple of minutes. So it will be not more than one and a half hour conversation. Okay. So, uh, so, so Kishore, he just got uh, promoted or unwillingly took on the position of being the chair of his department. So I don't know whether to congratulate him no, don't. or, you know, <laughs> send a, you know, whatever. Um, it's a mixed thing, but I think it's a great thing because knowing you, Kishore, and your uh, way of thinking about research and academic field, I think your department will, is very lucky to have you as the chair. So it's, it's really, um, really thrilled. Uh, as you all know, uh, uh, he is at the University of Texas. Uh, he, held, uh, he holds a, a chair. Uh, he has that, that kind of a chair position in other university also before coming to uh, University of Texas in 2014. He was Helen and Roy Professor of Economics at school, Texas A&M. And he also had a brief stint as a uh, big data analyst. He just ventured into private sector after leaving UNM. So he was at UNM for about 10 years as assistant professor and then associate professor. And then he went out to seek for green pastor. So, and he succeeded in doing so. And I think that will be one of the conversation topics today. Like um, he does a lot of political mm -hmm. research. He was trained. He was trained as a trade economist under um, Ed Lehmer of UCLA, uh, one of the best known uh, trade uh, theorists, empirical trade uh, scholars uh, with a, lots of Bayesian uh, slant. So he sort of learned a lot of Bayesian and I learned some Bayesian from him too. So uh, he's well-polished, well-rounded, interdisciplinary, he has moved on to other disciplinary area like child malnutrition, post-conflict. So he has ventured into other uh, related field. So hope to hear from him how he ventured into in that. So I'll put some sort of thematic question um, as we uh, move forward. He has published extensively in a very high visible journals, our stat, IO, GEM, uh, Journal of Development Economic, International Economic Review, JEPO Econ, just to name a few. And nine, several, about nine or 10 are sole authors. Pretty good uh, research record. Uh, in summary, he has a wealth of experience 
in quality research, impressive career moves, interdisciplinary research, risk taker. That's another thing that we'd like to hear from him. And he also has been very successful in writing uh, NSO grants. He has a lot of experience. I believe our consortium members would learn quite a bit from him. So, um, Kishore, let's just uh, begin by, let me ask you this. I know that you were a business school student, right? MBA, back in India. Give us a little journey, how you started with the business school, then went to math, and then how attract, how were, why, how were you attracted in economics? How did you do the transition? Oh my God, uh, Alok, you're taking me back to where we both started uh, a long time ago. And uh, it just seemed yesterday, it seems yesterday. It doesn't even seem a very long time ago. Uh, I started, I'm, I'm, I'm from India. I went to college in uh, Delhi, uh, college called St. Stephen's where I did my econ honors. It's a, it's a good college, but I truthfully did not learn any economics there. I don't think that uh, that system was conducive to learning. It was good system to rata maro and, and you know, do your exam and all that stuff. But uh, uh, then I went to uh, IIM Bangalore, which is the Indian Institute of Management in India. And uh, I was a marketing uh, junior marketing manager and I worked in uh, a cement company, associated cement company, big cement company in India, ACC. So I was a market, this is the, the, the use of talent that India had during that time. Um, I was a marketing manager in a product that was in sh such short supply because the government had clamped the price on it that there was a black market. So I'm the marketing manager of a product that is a shortage product with a huge black market. Okay. So, so it was a, it, it was a different kind of experience. And uh, I spent uh, one and a half years working there. And then uh, as Alok says, you know, I, in retrospect, that time I was thinking that, that, you know, I need to polish my marketing skills. This is not how I'm getting my skills. So I left a very cushy job and I, and I joined a plastic uh, company. You know, you've seen that Slumdog Millionaire movie? The Slumdog Millionaire yes, yes. movie. Uh, uh, look, you know that uh, the, the, the slums, I was selling plastic buckets outside those slums. Ah. Fantastic, uh, fantastic experience. So I learned a lot about uh, how to market. And then I, uh, at that time I decided, I, I got financial aid and I went to UCLA to do my PhD. In and so you seem to have a very similar uh, kind of a, a trajectory like, I did. I also started with math, stat, and then went to economics, right? I mean, that's what I did. And um, so anyway, so uh, during our conversation, Kishore, uh, don't mind me pausing you because we, I want to cover a lot of things. So I want yeah, yeah. Please interrupt if I'm yeah, going so, off on. So here. don't mind that. So let's just, uh, I know that the topic is about um, how to succeed in academia earlier, as well as the uh, end year and beyond and that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, but I do have a several um, questions, like thematically I've organized, I'd like to go through them. And our audience has uh, uh, sent uh, several questions. And so what I would like to do uh, to hear from you, give us a very brief overview first before going into several nitty gritty of each component that I have. So why don't you give us a little, your take on kind of a overview of the uh, whatever, you know, like the hoop going through it and, you know, just give us a little. Sure, sure. you know, so some, some, some highlights, uh, you know, in my, in my, my personal experience and uh, uh, you, 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 one of the things that when I was a grad student, uh, is is uh, I wanted to. I had already decided who I wanted to work with, and the, and my area wasn't clear, but the person I wanted to work with was very clear, which was Ed Lima, and uh, and I was interested in trade, 
but uh, I wanted to be with the with, with people who are you know real productive and doing things and uh, and he was really hot stuff at that time and uh, and I and and he doesn't he's a very tough guy to this day he doesn't uh, you know he's just a tough guy that's it so but that didn't deter me and I worked with him as an RA and so that was my first introduction to how you do research. So it really opened my mind about, you know, so he was a relentless uh, truth seeker. He, he, you know, whatever the, he, he didn't approach, the reason that he's Bayesian is that he knows people have very strong priors, but they're not necessarily reflected in the empirical results, you know? So your priors, if they're driving the empirical results, then to Ed Lemur, this was unsatisfactory. Are you telling me the truth from the data? And so uh, I learned a lot right in my early days about, uh, about uh, you know, that data are very, very special. You know, big or small data sets are very special. They have the truth, but you have to seek it out. And uh, sometimes the truth is messy uh, and so be it. And, and that's the extent of the truth that you're gonna get from the data. So I really learned early on. And then, uh, you know, I learned the Bayesian stuff. My dissertation was, applied Bayesian econometrics uh, to, to international trade. The bottom had fallen out of that market uh, when I had gone to the market. Remember, remember Alok, in 1991, there was a recession. And, uh, and so I, uh, I was so, so thrilled that I was getting, I, I had about uh, 10 interviews at that time. And, uh, and Ed, had specifically written to uh, to Alok, you know that this guy is special. I don't know what he wrote, but one uh, line. Oh, one line. <laughs> one line. Hey and, Alok, you might want to look into Kishore. That's all right. Uh, that's about the extent of the highest form of compliment you're going to get from Lima. Okay, so so uh, I am very thrilled. Alok uh, Alok interviewed me. Alok was. Uh, my interviewer, and I remember there was a camera uh, that, that you had to got uh, for the interview as well, and it was a fabulous interview. It's so clear in my mind, you're asking about the Russian, uh, you know, the, the USSR had just uh, imploded and all that stuff, and you were thinking about a new course, and we discussed that. Then I went on campus for an interview. Uh, that was a very high point in my, in my, in my, in my young days at that time. And, uh, and Ron Cummings, who was the chair, he, he gave me an offer the day I got back to, 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 to LA, uh, you know, the, the letter was waiting with this small note that if you don't accept this offer in like three days, it's gone. This is, so that's kind of, kind of not even legal, but that's Ron Cummings. Just I think after, after after he did that, we started following that three days thing. Now he's down to forty eight hours. <laughs> yeah, so I like I like so, sure. so so that's a very nice kind of a, a way of uh, uh, sort of sharing your job entry experience. So can you give us an idea as to while you're doing so, give us a, a industry norm your experience as well as any deviation you might take that might be useful for the current age, right? Current day, which might not be the same as back in 30 years ago or 25 years ago. So absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So with that, so give us an overview of how to sort of succeed in creating a overall portfolio for associate professor. And if you can go ahead and do, or you can pause, for the full. So give us a kind of a brief uh, couple of minutes. I would, I would, I would like to do that. I've thought a lot about this, you know, just when your email came, but even across uh, my career, uh, you know, some places have a very hard and fast rule about what you need in order to get tenure. So that is the case with, with us here at the Macomb School of Business, where it's actually written out that in every area, so if you're in management or you're in finance or you're in accounting, these are your A journals. So A journals, there'll be about a list of five A journals in each field, uh, six, maybe seven. 
and the unwritten or even you know the the, the de facto sort of rule is to come up for tenure here you need five A's uh, and that you know it's it's pretty that's the rule people follow because they need that kind of clarity now that's not that's not something that's followed everywhere uh, and, and econ departments are not necessarily like business schools. And uh, I can tell you about our econ department at UT Austin, it's not like this. Uh, so for example, you know, a portfolio of uh, top field journals, like Journal of Public Economics, JDE, JIE, uh, GEME, uh, if you have a portfolio of that and one, top general journal, right? So, so Ari Star, Econometrica, JP, AER, you know, the, the top five. If you have one of those and, and you, have a, you have a nice portfolio of these top field journals of about three, four, five, then you have a very good chance of making tenure here at, uh, at the econ department in, in, the, in, the, in, in UT Austin. When I, when I came up for promotion, uh, at UNM, the rules were fairly, uh, they were not written down. There, 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 were, there was subjectivity, but there was objectivity too. I mean, you, you know, people like, uh, people like Alok, the seniors like Alok were very, very tough and tight about the quality of, of, of research. And that was, in Alok's mind, what was going to determine your tenure. So I learned a lot from being around Alok. I, I, I really do. I'm not just saying this because Alok's hosting it. Uh, uh, only Alok knows the amount of, the enormous amount of respect I have for him, for, for, for standing his own ground on, on, on things like this. It was immovable for, for him. It doesn't, doesn't matter, friend, no friend, Nothing mattered. You, you got to have quality research. And, uh, and that's what Alok was about. You would come into his room and, 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 and that's it. You know, the computer opened, uh, so you, you know, and, 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 and it was all, all work. And it was fun also. And, oh, and sure. Just to add to that, you know, like you have a very, we have a very broad audience here, right? And, and you alluded to the fact that different departments may have different uh, standards. So there could be some unwritten, some places may have a written standard, right? So do you have any advice how to kind of a, uh, create a portfolio that might sort of address either of the two, right? Whether it's the unwritten rule or the written rule, what do you suggest to our young audience? I, 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 I like that question. It's also a difficult question. It's not a very easy question to answer. My, my, my rule always have, has been to not play a game. Don't strategize this. Uh, you know, you have to enjoy what you do and bring your strength to the table and, and develop new strengths from working with others. So one of the things that I didn't do very well in my first few years was I only worked on sole authored papers. This is, uh, this, this, this could be a very costly strategy, but you know, I was influenced by Ed Lehmer and his thing was, you know, uh, he, he'd never co-authored with, with his students. I have worked so hard for him. I should have had at least two papers with him, but he just wasn't that type. And so I learned that. But that, and, uh, if I if I recall, Kishore, at least you got a couple of footnotes from me. I got a footnote on. <laughs> thank you, Alok. Right. That that Bayesian diagnostics paper in Econometrica, I got a footnote saying saying able research done by. If I if I tell you how many hundreds of hours, I spent, but you know, I, I I really admire him to this day for that reason. But then and you also ended up building a good bridge with him, right? I, 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 right. I so sometimes as a grad student, you have to swallow that. <laughs> and I, 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 I totally, I, I learned so much, but I would say, and, and Alok's made out of the same, uh, cut out of the same cloth as me, that, that you, you have to enjoy your work, bring your strength. And when you're co-authoring, 
bring, bring complementary strengths to your table. Uh, so, so, so you, you, sir, just to, I, I'll get back to this uh, sort of a co-authorship issue and then the single author thing, because as we move uh, towards more interdisciplinary research and economics, which is happening very rapidly, right? Economists are working with uh, doctor in global health and the engineer in sustainability. I think it, it got to be co-authorship culture, right? That's in economics happens. I would like to come back to that uh, later. But I remember in your own experience, you said that you start out with working alone, and that also showed some sort of a risk. So you are a risk taker. That's what I said earlier in my introduction, that you took a risk and you said, Okay, instead of um, trying to uh, publish in several papers at the same time and see what happens, you said, well, I'm gonna take my chance and get this, let's say our stat in. If I'm good, then it's in, I'm done, right? I, I, I get my tenure or uh, renewal. If I don't, that's a risk you took. Do you, do you think that that kind of risk everyone should be taking or what do you suggest to a lot of uh, crowd here, younger crowd? I, I would not suggest taking risks right now just for that reason. I mean, you know, you, you, you definitely want to work on your one sole authored paper or two sole authored papers, but that cannot be an exclusive strategy because the times have moved on and there is just so much. And so exactly when you use the term interdisciplinary, uh, it's a it's a big it's a big word and 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 it's not possible it's not humanly possible to bring the kind of strengths that you need to publish in an interdisciplinary way just you, you know in the introduction alok you're saying that this is a group of scholars interested in the himalayan region and and interested in in development and health and 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 and, and these kinds of things you, you know sub, take a take a topic like water right where there is going to be this is going to be the biggest struggle in the world in the future, one of the biggest. And here is a region that's plentiful in water as of now. There is very little work done in this area. And I'll tell you why, because nobody thinks that they have, I mean, this specific water in the Himalayan region area. I don't, I mean, maybe there is a lot of work which I haven't read, but I don't think that the big breakthrough work which is needed is coming out. The reason is that no one person can do this. It requires a lot of people from a lot of different areas with their strengths coming in and resolving this. For example, you need an international relations person. And, and you wouldn't think that you need an international relations person to solve this policy problem, but you do. And you need the geo people, and you need the economists, and you need the big data people. This is a this is a very big problem, and 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 once you have it together, I think some great research can come out of uh, topics like this. So, so I I'll come back to that uh, that sort of a um, um, creative uh, topic in economics, or the economists can solve down the road. I have one of the themes. I'll kind of get back to it. So, you give a little bit of a flavor as to don't focus too much on the very exclusive risk taking um, strategy that might backfire. And a lot of times at the dean level, you will have people from different departments and looking at your Vita and they just count the number of uh, publications. They really don't understand where and how and the single out. They'll just count, right? Yes. So in order to be on the safe side, what you're suggesting is to go for a portfolio approach, right? Try to yes. hit a couple of sole authors and a few sort of a interdisciplinary whatever, play the number game also mixed with the quality. Is that what yes. I'm hearing? I, I, absolutely. I, I am very confident that that strategy is correct for another reason too. That, you know, a lot, a lot of people think that the top, that, that the publication that they're going to be known for comes at this early stage in their career. If you just just you know take a take a sample of of when different people have published their best works, and you will find that it's done after promotion because you've got this view. You put in your costs when you're an assistant professor you're, and, and a postdoc. You're sinking in costs. You're 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 accumulating human capital. 
you know, so, and, and accumulating human capital is an interdisciplinary exercise, uh, at least in, in definitely in this day and age. So I just so wanted I'll, to add. I'll, I'll, make, uh, I'll make one exception on that. Uh, there's only one person who didn't follow your advice on that, Kishore. That's uh, uh, Einstein. <laughs> he was not even in academia. He was a patent uh, uh, a patent lawyer, yeah, patent. And then uh, he published four paper changed the world of physics. Okay, so with that, <laughs> uh, now give give us like a one or two minutes, and I'll come back to all the theme you touched uh, about the full professor. So now you you gave us a little bit an idea of what the norm is, what your experience has been, and what you are suggesting outside the box or maybe even outside your own practice. So now give us a little uh, something about the full. So for to go up a full professor, one of the one of the most important parts of your packet is the external letters that you're going to get, and the external letters. You, you want to you want to make sure that first of all the external letters are written by reputable people and who are going to be reading a lot of this material that you're writing and it's not very easy for reputable people to write very good letters about your research unless and until you've been out there so my, my, my top advice is don't hesitate to present your papers at, a, at many places. This is the, this is the number one, if you, if you want formula for success, is to get your name out there. And, and, and people will remember you for the paper you presented and how you responded to questions and, and just your, your presence in that area. And, and you know what's the best thing about when you go to present papers, a lot of people think that, okay, nervous, I'm going to present, I want to, from the audience's point of view, they're sitting there and they're saying, what did I learn from this paper? It's actually much easier than you think because you have done so much research and you're talking about it and your audience goes, I learned something. And that's it. Once you, once you go and have that experience with the audience, they will remember you when they write your letters. So Kishore, I just remember one incident where you said to me that you were at a conference and you saw the associate editor of a journal and he went, you went to him because your paper was on, 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 on the journal that he was in and you gave your paper to him for feedback. With the, with the little uh, psychological strategy that when he sees your paper as a formal submission, you, you're gonna get in. Did you get that paper in in that paper? I did. I, I, I did get it in. I did get it in. I also got a paper in GM uh, because I went straight to the editor at a conference. Right? He wasn't handling my paper, but he had given it to an AE, an associate editor, to handle the paper. I was never shy. I mean, what, at, at worst, what's going to happen? It is going to say, no. Okay, we've got to have a thick skin. We are, we are academics. So, so basically, you, you shouldn't be afraid to sell yourself. Don't be afraid at all. Okay. Everybody is doing this, and, 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 and not just yourself. You know, that shows a lot of confidence. That's the number one thing. But the other thing is you always have things to tell people that they don't know. Don't sell yourself short is, 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 is all. Yeah. And the other uh, thing I remember from our conversation has to do with um, I remember you saying something that about a paper that you shared with me and you said, oh, this, uh, this paper just got rejected and I'm going to send to the second. I think that was uh, some of the papers maybe we had co-authored. And you said, well, I think we, we need to include fear for new citation into it. That's been, that appeared in the new journal that you were gonna send it to. Is that another strategy like market manipulation? I I I I I I think you 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 know you. This is a this is you, you know when you're when you're going when you're going. I I would call publication a game, but it's it's a necessary game, and 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 different people play this game differently. Like at the top schools, they have their clubs. 
you know and and these clubs are are they 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 are at the editor level associate editor level they know that crowd they'll they'll send papers to you, you know referees who are going to be uh, pro uh, the, the 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 author and and things like that you know so you're competing here you're competing with this group and in order to get your and your paper is good okay let's that, that that's that's going to have to be a bottom line that your paper has to be good and and even after the paper is good it requires some I, I wouldn't call it market manipulation but some strategizing and strategy is a good thing and 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 one of the best strategies is to present papers around and to get to know people and they'll also inform you about how they do this if they were you know, often I present a paper and then, you know, at dinner or something, I go like, how would you sell a paper like this? And you will get fantastic responses because everybody's got their strategizing about, about papers. Okay, so, so my sharing. bad, my bad in using the word manipulation. So I, <laughs> so uh, I think that's a good uh, review of things. So I would like to go into some of the specific questions that some of our audience members had asked. And the first is, um, like, how do you transition from, let's say, postdoc to tenure track position? What kind of advice would you have? Uh, since now you are a chair, and if there is a postdoc uh, at your department, so of course that postdoc would like to move on to the next uh, position. So what's your advice? I, I would repeat uh, what I'm saying. Uh, I think postdocs, a great period where you get a lot of time to think and do your research. This is very precious time, which you won't get because you, you know, as a postdoc, you're not teaching and that's a huge responsibility. And you, and as, as you know, if you're an assistant professor, you're teaching three, four classes, sometimes more. And postdoc is a fantastic time. And, and you, you know, you might not, you might not believe this, but postdocs, people like, postdocs to come and present papers in the department because they think and they know that the postdocs are the cutting edge of something new. And, and that's how you want to sell yourself or that's how you want to sell your paper or position yourself. But I think postdoc is a fantastic uh, opportunity to do this. And, uh, and uh, uh, would you also agree with me that uh, when we think of postdoc means some big professor with the grand gating uh, ability has gotten big data, big surveys, big experiment, big whatever the big data, right? And so, uh, so postdocs have good access to big data. Postdocs have great access to big data. You, you want to, you also want to worry about a couple of things here. One is, I mean, I, I, I don't want to paint an overly rosy picture, but but all these opportunities exist. But remember, you know, when somebody gets a big grant and you're a postdoc, the grant getter wants something from you. And it's very easy to get swept into this because your time is very, that's what you've got. Your time is extremely precious and you've got to figure out where you're going to spend your time. It's a, it's a very, it's a limited quantity. And so, and you're not going to get the credit if you are a co-author as a junior on a big grant run by somebody who's very senior. So later on, when you come up for tenure and you say, I did this great paper, others will say, no, that great paper is that great person's paper. You know, so you, you so want your identity. There, so is there any way, is there, sorry to interrupt you, is there any way a postdoc can carve out uh, a section of the data with the permission of the professor to work on it, uh, you know, like alone. Of course, or, and, and, and all- As the lead author. That's right, I was going to say exactly that. And Alok and I have had these discussions many times that, that uh, you know, in economics, uh, th there are pretty good set standards. This is, I learned a lot about being in a business school. Alok, that's not, the, that's not necessarily true in let's say management. That 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 you know, uh, alphabetical. Uh, you know, the order of authorship is not like in economics, where 
either it's alphabetical or order of authorship matters. Okay, so so we, we've had many of these discussions. And so if you are, as a postdoc, doing things in a team, make sure that one paper is yours and, and, and has you as a, as a lead author. It's not difficult at all because, uh, you, you know, the, the person running the grant or whoever is a big name will be very happy to do this. They'll be okay. extremely happy to do this. So, okay, so that's a good advice as to some of our uh, members are uh, doing a postdoc and pretty bright uh, 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 graduates or about to graduate. So I think that's a good advice. And uh, so there are a couple of uh, questions about the mentoring because some of our faculty deal with the grad students and they wanna know how to motivate grad students to go into academia, right? How do you kind of, uh, I know sometimes you just teach and you do thesis something, but then is there any way you can suggest how, how to motivate those students to go into academia, like in research teaching a field, rather than, you know, like let's say private sector or public? This is especially uh, uh, true today because private sector opportunities are pretty darn good if you've got good quantitative training and things like that. So, uh, or policy, you know, so, so if you're, if you're, for example, in political science, in a policy area, you know, firms like Facebook are going to look at you and go like, okay, you bring, uh, you, you're going to solve our problems in, in Myanmar, I want to hire you. So there's a lot of opportunities for people from, who are well-trained in, in, in and, 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 and therefore, there's even more pressure in academia. I mean, if you're considering an academic career, it's a it's a fantastic career. It's 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 a it's a career where you know you're doing what you love. You get a lot of time to yourself. Lifestyle is good, but you know, if you're anything like Alok and me, there are no summer vacations and winter vacations. That's not the attractive. The attractive part of of academia is like you've got a summer vacation where you can devote time to your research, okay? So that's what's attractive about a summer break to us. And I'm I, I, motivating, if you're a grad student and you're doing your PhD, you, you're, 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 you're already thought about these things. And, and, and uh, I think getting, getting excited about policy and specific areas is the best motivator for academics. It's so is that motive. is that so? What you're suggesting is maybe the professors, uh, some of our members, working with their students is to pick out a topic and the exciting, uh, you know, uh, Absol uh, absolu absolutely, absolutely. That you, might... you remember, you remember, yeah. Alok, we we had this JIE paper uh, yeah. with Ter Teresa and and yeah. and, uh, and and our Etam, uh, Etam. Alejandro, Ale Ale Alex, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they were. You, can, I, I cannot tell you how excited yes, Alex and, and and Teresa were working on that. They did the entire empirical part of that. Yeah, thing. and 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 it's all because of the topic uh, that we had picked uh, to work on. So I think they themselves were very excited about the topic. Yeah. We, we had done we had done a lot of work on this and conceptualized yeah. the project, and 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 they took it ahead. Yeah. yeah. So basically what you're saying then is, I think it's, there's, a, there's not a whole lot of, a professor can do to, you know, like in terms of motivation, other than to create a very rich uh, research topic environment so that they can get, uh, get excited about it. But uh, look, that is saying a lot, you know, where the professor, grad students can sense that the commitment of a professor to their success. And they'll be drawn to these kinds of professors who have a commitment to student success. That's actually itself saying a very big thing. Don't 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 imagine that everybody is like that. Okay. So you know? the fact that uh, a student wants to work with a type of professor already has that kind of a motivation, uh, uh, underlying motivation there. Of, of course, okay. many so, professors have a very arm's length relationship. With yeah. Them. So a um, related question one of our members had asked 
uh, was about, uh, and, and a couple of them are in liberal arts colleges, right? And so they will have to deal with the undergraduate uh, advisement and so on. So as a new faculty, you know, sometimes you're thrown into this assignment of undergraduate advisement. What do you kind of a, give them some, can you give some tips? How they of course, I, I, I love my undergrads. I love my undergrads. I, 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 love, I love seeing talent and you're going to see a lot of talent. And it's your job to develop that talent. I mean, we are from, many of us are from countries where talent is completely wasted, uh, you know, right from fifth grade onwards. And, and that's, the, that's the worst part of, 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 of the countries that many of us are from. So India wastes 30, 40, 50% of its talent, wastes it, it's gone. Because after fifth standard, if you don't know how to speak English or know your mathematics, your career is already determined. So you're in a privileged position, uh, you know, to, to and, and, and if you're in a liberal arts school or, or, a, or a school like mine, you're going to get very talented undergrads. The responsibility of developing this talent is yours. This is a privilege. This is an opportunity of a lifetime. You will look back when you're, uh, you, you know, older like us and say, did you make a difference at that time? You, you will have to reckon with your own thinking about what is it that you did. You know, you can count your publications and all that, but really what you did is to create that talent pool, which is going to go on and solve the problems. So, is, uh, so what you're saying is in terms of undergraduate, well, I mean, there's, not, there's no manual and no, no sort of formula. It just happens naturally. There, there is a huge amount of heterogeneity. Uh, oh, look, undergrads okay. are not undergrads, you know? Yeah, okay. So 50% so of them will come to you because they want a recommendation letter. Okay, fine. Right, right, I know, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, so but there is anyway, a whole so, lot. Yeah, moving on, there is another important, uh, 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 I think the many of our members have senior Vita. And one thing that they uh, kind of noticed was, oh, Dr. Gawande has done quite a bit career moves, very successful. And of course, anytime you think of career moves, there's this thing called brand, right? You have to have a brand to take with you. Otherwise, who is going to buy that? So can you shed some light as to how to create a, a brand and Tell us how to, some of our younger audience is also interested in how to make a career move. And when is the right time to move, uh, make a move like that? So your experience tells a volume here in terms of uh, your own successes. So give us some tips. Thank you for this question. It's a, it's, a, it's a really important question. One is, you know, testing the market is not a bad thing. We are economists. And and, and you can test them, it doesn't matter whether you're moving or not, but, I, and, and, and here's where Alok and I differ a lot. Uh, thank you for asking Alok and for, 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 for letting me answer this question. And I test the market pretty regularly because, not because I want to move, but because I want to see what the market thinks of where I am. So it's not a, it's not a bad thing to do at all. So every two, three years I would go on the market and, 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 and learn about what this market was, where it was going. That's one, so no shame in, 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 in thinking about the market because the market will give you the signal about when it's time to move, et cetera. And then you have your own personal circumstance. That's also going to be a big determination about when, when to move. The brand part is very important because I learned that from Alok, in fact. Uh, Alok's brand was, you, you know, he was this time series person. He, he very, there are very few uh, people at, at that time who, who had the time series expertise that, that, that Alok had. But more, he, Alok had a lot of quantitative stuff backing him up, but that was Alok's brand. And, at, and in every paper, he was very sought after because of his quantitative brand. And so my brand was, 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 was international trade and political economy. So that was the, the two things that I was bringing together. And in my time, that was a very, that was a growing field. And political economy itself was like an exploding field. 
you know, Tabellini, etc. They were doing some fantastic work. So I was the beneficiary of that, uh, of that, uh, the field itself. And if you want to call it a brand, my brand was in, in bringing empirics to bear on testing theories. Uh, so you've got to really understand the theory, which means that you've got to have your trade stuff together and you're bringing the, the, the econometrics brand. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to test theories very well. And, and uh, this was a challenging thing at that time because, you know, th there are not many papers in which people test theory. So uh, they you, I remember, uh, sorry, I remember your uh, several of your papers and continued uh, into the, I don't know, uh, in recently, you, ex uh, you describe yourself as empirical trade economist, right? And then your brand was to look at some hexaroline and all kinds of uh, trade theory and test them, you know, left, right, up, down, all kinds of things using Bayesian and all sorts of things. So basically what you're saying is uh, find out your comparative advantage and build on. Uh, absolutely. And, and, and so, Rick, get the word out there. Always right. present your papers at seminars, okay. at, at closed seminars, not these big, uh, you know, thousand right. people. So now uh, I'm, I'm looking at my watch here uh, uh, with few minutes left. Um, <clears throat> so one question had to do with how to make a sort of a difference in the real world as an economist going beyond academic success. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I thought of someone like Krugman, right? He's going out and fighting whatever for his economic thought. So is this something that economists uh, can do? Somebody, somebody's interested in doing so. How do you sort of reconcile pure academic versus doing something for the uh, you know, real world thing? It's a very difficult uh, gig to do. I mean, I would not recommend doing writing op-eds and going on the press when you're very young. I would say you want to you want to devote yourself to research, but but if you're let's suppose you're in a business school, or you're in a liberal arts college, or you're in a town where you're the you know your research is required. So let's suppose you're an environmental economist and who's done stuff on climate, and and suddenly in the press you know in your town they, they want somebody to tell us about climate things and the wildfires in California. Don't shy away from that opportunity. It's a, it's a, you're, you're, you're doing service to the community. And so basically what you're saying is if there's a demand in the community in terms of to speak up on minimum wage, climate change, yes. renewable energy, yes. it, uh, grab that opportunity. Yes, but writing op-eds alone takes a lot of time yeah. away from So it. don't give up your research, focus on that, great. So my final question is this, and then, um, uh, you know, like in, in the 70s, we had the big structural break model, CG, cutting edge economics thing, right? CGs, time series, and uh, then came experimental economic network theory, neural network, machine learning, Bayesian, MCMC, all that. So I'm not talking about the tools. I'm talking about economic sort of issues, right? For example, climate change, inequality, social mass media thing happening so much. So what's the cutting edge uh, a research question out there that economists can uh, make a difference in terms of solving them? There is just so many. I mean, if I started, look, if you and I were, were, were young again, this would be like a fantastic time for us. One of the things, so, so, so I think that if Alok and I were young, I would force him to take uh, my data or his data to, to heterogeneous uh, uh, treatment effects, for example, right? So if you're really into, into quantitative stuff and you've got your question and you're trying to push the boundaries of what you're doing, uh, I, I, I would say because, because treatment effects are, are intrinsically heterogeneous. So that's one. I'm, I'm just giving some examples. So one of the big unsolved issues today is about regulating regulating right so so this is a big interdisciplinary question which has come to us and nobody has a solution because in the old days about regulation like is this a monopoly and you know the the microsoft type of regulation 
monopoly power, all that is out of the window. Is Amazon a monopoly? Is Facebook a monopoly? From the old tools, you're not going to be able to solve this question. Should you be regulating these firms? These are big questions that nobody has answers to. How are you going to resolve something that's really changing society so rapidly? And that, that, that's one which is interdisciplinary. I wanted to bring the water uh, part to bear. Any big research on water is going to be cited from today till infinity. This is the time to make that contribution because you're going to accumulate citations to your water paper like you wouldn't believe. But your water paper should have heterogeneous treatment effects, should have all kinds of you know, new cutting so, so what you're saying is in terms of the research, just to uh, clarify, in, in terms of the natural ex experiment, like the observational study we all do, go for the randomized control trial with the heterogeneity treatment effect. That kind of you, you could, look, but, but heterogeneous treatment effects are not, I'm not a big uh, field experiment person. I'm talking about, you know, different diff and things like that are all basically estimating treatment effects, but they're not estimating heterogeneous treatment. Yeah. Even non-experimental data. This is a big, this is a big unresolved problem. So anyway, we've come to the final uh, leg of my uh, segment here. And just one question I had, I remember uh, I had one question. We don't have a whole lot of time. We can do that uh, next segment with uh, Dr. Adhikari and Wang, but uh, I'll throw that at you and maybe you can take up uh, during that time, which is uh, the balance between sort of a academic life and family life. And I the, especially, don't answer that, especially the incident I remember, the way you handled your uh, life I saw was, I was slightly different than you. You, uh, I don't know, you did feed your kids when they were small and then put them to bed at 10 o'clock you came to office and slept there and did all of your work until three or four a.m. and went home. So with that, that's how he handled his uh, uh, family and academic life. So I'm, I'm gonna kind of uh, let it sit there. And with that, Mandy, would you allow please Dr. Adhikari and Dr. Wong to come and sort of uh, continue this discussion. Thank you, Alok. All right, Jinjing, uh, Prakashi, it's all yours. And there are some questions, you go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Professor Gawande, thank you so very much for enlightening us. This is such a fantastic informational um, um, talk, discussion. When we were putting together this thing, I told Professor Bohora, I wish we had done this when I, I was still going up for my uh, tenure and promotion. Uh, but nonetheless, I still have, you made me feel uh, like uh, I still have things to do and there's still time for me to do more. So oh, thank Lord. you, that's Lord. super exciting and inspiring. Uh, but I do have a few questions uh, that I would like to ask. Uh, but before doing that, I have a question from uh, Vivek here. Uh, the question is, how do you, how do you uh, diversify your job market in terms of seeking opportunities, right? So would you rather just focus on the mainstream, like the American Economic Association's job listing? Or uh, yeah, how do, you, how do you cast your net uh, in such a manner that you get? Uh, Absolutely. So Vivek also had a very uh, similar question on chat. The thing is, if if it's if it's if you're an economist and you're you're exploring the economic market, then the JOE is the is the marketplace, and it's a fantastic marketplace. I mean, it's got it's got it's got it's got different tiers that you can target. And so it's a very efficient marketplace. Uh, it, it clears, um, and and I'm a I'm a big believer in the JOE. But I've whenever I have explored job opportunities, 
I, I used to always look up now, these days they don't have such a big list, but in the old days, the Economist magazine would run a lot of academic jobs and policy oriented jobs in its front page and its back page. And so I've got two jobs from that. I mean, I didn't take it, but I, 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 I applied and everything and I got two jobs. One of them was at the National University of Singapore. And I was, I was all like so excited about the job uh, till, uh, you know, then I got tenure at, uh, at the UNM and I said, okay, I'm going to stay here. But uh, I think the JOE is that these days you have Glassdoor and LinkedIn and all kinds of things, but those are more private sector oriented. I think if, you, if you're in the academic job market, there is no escaping APSA. So, so Prakash, when 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 you went to the market, did you go to the to the Midwest market or the APSA market? Uh, I did all the above and more. <laughs> that, that's 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 exactly yeah. You know, there's just a lot of opportunities, but for economists, JOE is is great. It's it's just great. So, I I. I, I would I would say that uh, you know there's too much information about about uh, who's looking for jobs and what kinds of jobs exist. We we academics shouldn't sell ourselves short. We have a lot to tell the world, and the world needs us now. And so uh, you know there there is there is different ways to do this. Even if you are in academics, I I highly encourage connecting with the real world and its problems. I, I worked with the World Bank, not, 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 not for any other reason, but, but because I thought that they were really deficient in, 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 in political economy at that time. And so I, wanted to, I went to present a paper at the World Bank and then I started talking to people and then I said, okay, how about uh, you know, uh, letting me come here for one summer? So I spent a whole summer there, and then it turned into a two-year association with trade people there, which led to you know a few publications, and 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 they can they, they are very policy influential, obviously, and so a lot of that got reflected in policy. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to add that. Uh... In addition to American Political Science Association and Midwest Political Science Association and ISA, which are our mainstream uh, uh, venues for seeking job, uh, the current job that I have right now, I actually got it from the Chronicles of Higher Education. All right, all right, yeah, that's and, correct. Uh, yeah, I and, have I have looked up the Chronicles of Higher Ed and applied as well. I have done that, and then so that's there. But there is a question from uh, Shankar Gimire. I'm, I'm reading Shankar's question, Prakash. So uh, transitioning from faculty to admin positions and the right stage, you, you know, there, there, there is no right stage. And, 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 and let me give you two examples. One is the president of, of UT Austin is a PhD from, he's a finance uh, PhD. He, he is a PhD from U UT Austin, and he got his tenure here. And at, as soon as he got his tenure as an associate professor, and he's a real estate scholar and, and that's his area, he decided that he wanted to become chair of the department. That's the time, and he's, a, he's fantastic. He's got that talent. But it's not when I talk to him, his name is Jay Hartzell. When I talk to him, he's saying, you know, I exactly this question that Shankar is asking. He says, you know, it's not, it's not a pre-decided thing. I, he is saying that I got a lot of reaction from my finance profs that you are the right person to be chair because you've got all these qualities. Not that, I, not that he knew he had these qualities, but there was this supply side and demand side thing that made him realize that he had all these talents and he was very good at it. And once he became chair, there was no looking back. He became the Dean of Macombs just as a very young full professor. And after three years as Dean, he's the president of the university, you know, just rising star. 
but but transitioning to an admin position requires you to have admin kind of talent you have to love the people and you have to love solving problems you cannot shy away from that because once you're in an admin position you get up and there are 30 emails five of which are difficult 25 of which are okay easy but that's the that's the job you're solving problems every day and you have to be the motivator people have to you're not i'm not saying you have to be loved and liked you have to love and you have to like that's a good admin And I'm experiencing all this as chair of my department. And so I better follow my own advice. Well, we wait for, for the questions here, Professor Gowandi. If I may take you back to one of the points you made earlier about uh, research and publication strategy, uh, you almost made it sound like there's got to be a balance between quality and your publication strategy to get your, your manuscript out and get published. How do you, in your observation, in your academic career, if you were to uh, evaluate the review process from when you started up until now, uh, how would you how would you evaluate? What would you think about the quality of the reviews that you are getting? So I think uh, so. There, there are two questions, uh, Prakash. One is about quality and quantity in terms of publications, and one is about reviews. So the the that's probably a. a, 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 a an indoctrination from my PhD days with Ed Limer. And he was only about quality. That's it. He, he, he didn't, he wouldn't listen to anything else, right? So, uh, so uh, he only wanted us to submit to, you know, not knowing that not everybody is like him, all right? So, but uh, I think it's a, it's a good experience. You know, you go through, so, so here's one experience. Uh, and and Alok will uh, w w might also remember when I was a uh, my first paper, which was which came out of my dissertation, I submitted it to AER. I got an RNR, and I was thinking, okay, like you know, well, this is sort of natural. Alok came and told me that that's not natural. Drop everything and focus on that. That's it. That's all you do. Just make sure you get this. Long story short, I did not get that. Age. I got rejected in like the third round or something like that. But the great part of that was I published three A grade papers from that one, and two of them are in political science. One of them went to IO, one of them went to some other political science paper, and, and one of them is Aristat. So just going through that process is a, is a big learning. You know, you get reviews. Getting a good review is an awesome thing. And, and I think that I learned a lot from submitting to quality journals. And then you figure out your equilibrium and, 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 and don't, don't settle for less, settle for your equilibrium. And my equilibrium was at RESTAT. It was not Econometrica. It was not Journal of Econometrics. I got rejected at all those places. Oh my God, I've got rejection letters like you wouldn't believe, no problem. But I've learned a lot from doing that. So don't sell yourself short, find your equilibrium. And I think that's the best uh, you know, experiential advice I can give. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Jing Jing. Thank you, Prakash. And thank you so much, Dr. Gawani. Uh, I learned so many insightful advice today. Uh, so let's first, I say there's another new question in the chat box. Um, asking about the difference between a business, like the college, big, like business school versus economics department. Um, like, are they different or are they similar? Any strategy that for new faculty to be successful uh, in the two types of institutions? 
Yes, you know, uh, business business schools are quite different from econ departments. My econ department is just down the road, and I go there for uh, you know seminars and stuff. But most of my life is in the business school. So the business school is different because it's a combination. So I've been, I I was the the the, the chair of the most powerful committee at Macomb, which is the Promotion and Tenure Committee, the PNT Committee. Mm -hmm. For five years, I've been. Uh, for three years, I've been chair of that committee and, 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 and six years on that committee. I've learned a lot. And what I've learned is that the representation on this committee, which is one from every department, so you're coming and you're making a decision on the future of people who you wouldn't ordinarily know about. You wouldn't know about Journal of Finance. You wouldn't know uh, uh, general of accounting research, you wouldn't know other things. And in this PNT uh, uh, position, I have to read all of that stuff. And uh, one thing I've learned is that all of them learn their econometrics from economics, from, from, from economists. So they are pretty far behind on the, on the econometrics. We are actually way ahead as economists on you know treatment effects and things like that and and that's actually seeping into these disciplines but they are way ahead conceptually in their area so the tax people and the accounting people think differently finance people think differently management people think strategy and 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 and, and you know it's it's your your that's the business school you you're you're interacting on a daily basis with people from different backgrounds and uh, and, and, and the economist mindset is a different mindset than in a business school. It's just a different mindset because uh, you, you know, you're, you're, you're collectively part of a group that's very interdisciplinary in a sense. It's not like I'm doing accounting research or I'm doing management research, but I have to appreciate where they are coming from. And I think that makes it very different, but we are all, together in, 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 in educating very smart students, just like you all are, and they all have very different interests. So I think the heterogeneity in interests of the students is very different from in an econ department, where you know it's an econ major, or an econ minor, and you know, you know your micro and your macro and stuff, and here that's not. So for example, I've only been teaching out of, Alok will stop talking to me if I tell him this, but I have only been teaching cases in my last five years. So my, 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 my class is called uh, Business and Global Political Economy, 18 cases, business, Harvard Business School cases. And I do case studies every class to do strategy and thinking big picture, but I'm bringing economics in without you know, too much data and stuff like that because it's a very interdisciplinary audience. That sounds really fun, just teaching cases. <laughs> it, it is fun, like but, but don't, don't tell that to Alok. He will, he, will, he will tell you, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's actually connects very well to the next question in the chat box. So Mandy asked about, uh, are there strategies for triggering students' interest in economics? when most of the students are actually in business major. So, because, you know, the same happens at UAM, we actually have a lot of business major taking intro, micro and macro. So, is there any specific uh, strategies we can trigger the student interests? Of course, economics is at the heart of all, uh, all business. I mean, <laughs> you know, one way to, to, to tell uh, business students and they like it when I, you know, even in the case studies that I do in class, when the topic turns to learning economics, like, you know, there's a case and they want to know things about devaluation without having any background, you know, they're coming from some other background. And you've got to explain devaluation to them. And you've got about 10 minutes to do so. It's a very challenging thing, but it's very exciting for them to know that they finally understand the meaning of devaluation and what it implies for business. You, 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 you can do it in this context, 
but it takes a lot of thinking. You, you cannot take a textbook version to them and explain devaluation with like that P and R formula. You cannot do that. You've got to, you know, bring experiences from the real world and explain it to them. The, the fun thing is that even econ majors who are in my class, they love this discussion about devaluation, right? Because like it's a real world discussion. And, uh, and it goes all the way back to my, to my teaching macroeconomics at UNM. This is how I used to do it. They, I used to do the formula thing, but then I would fast forward into the real world. And it was very exciting for everyone. So I, th I, th I think uh, there's a huge role for economics in everything, especially in a business school. But how we kind of convey these ideas to get them excited is important. And you cannot do it like we do it in an econ class. Here's a textbook, here's a formula, here's how you do it. No, that doesn't work with everybody. Yeah, I think even in economics, we are thinking about, because I'm on the undergraduate committee this year. So we actually think about like, we are just too out of date on this teaching economics fitting in this new world today. So we actually keep thinking about we should start like new way of teaching, like start with a case, start with a problem, start with a project, and then bring in the econ ideas, skills. So I think that's actually maybe the future way of teaching. <laughs> you, you, you know, Jing Jing, it's not the future. The future is here. The reason is going back to Alok's question about what are the big questions today. The big questions today require you to think like an economist, but in new ways. You cannot now bring in your monopoly theory to Amazon because they're not, they're not making profit. Where's monopoly profits? Amazon is Amazon because it sells you things cheap. Facebook is free. Where's the, where's the profits? They, 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 the profits come from all the information they have taken about you and you don't even know it. And how are you going to think like an economist about privacy and things like that? This is not a free good anymore. This goes back to things that we know. These are public goods and public bads, but how do you tax this? You can bring all of these things to bear, but nobody does. We, we have the right ways of thinking about big problems. And, 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 and like you're saying, you know, you bring the big problem into class, everybody's going to get very excited about it. And, and, and so, for example, the last, just to, just to finish this discussion, just two days ago, I wanted to do a climate and 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 regulation exercise. Right, so my 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 my, my class is called global regulatory strategy. Mm -hmm. So how do you how are you going? You, you know, so there was this big case in in the Hague, and 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 the and the and the, and the courts told Shell that they have to reduce emissions by 30, 40 percent. Not their own emissions; they just sell oil but emissions downstream, which they don't own. How is Shell going to do this? How are you going to think about this problem if you are a Shell manager? Only economists can tell you how to do this, but not, not through a formula. It's through a way of thinking about things and upstream, downstream linkages and how you bring pressure to bear and, and how are you going to do this? We have the answers. But 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 you want to you want to bring these things into the classroom because the future is here, it is here. I totally agree, and I think that's where the uh, research interacts with teaching because when we think big and then we bring the big problems to the class and then we have the like the most interesting discussion there. So, so true. This is the biggest value of the research outside of your publications and your own personal. Uh, you know, trajectory upwards. Your research is so valuable. You know, students, we don't understand these as, as especially as, as young assistant professors. Students are in great admiration of professors till they're not. If you give them a read, they're very smart. And if they see that they're not learning what they need to learn in class, you are downgraded very fast. But if you're able to do this, they love you and they, they, they regard you so much, just like you know when they see you for the first time. Don't, don't sell yourself short in class. You have a lot to offer. 
there's one take home message I've learned. Don't sell yourself short, either your research or teaching or service. <laughs> just think, Jing Jing, just think about how much investment you made and how much investment people have made in you. I've done that calculation. For a PhD student, the university and the professors and their time is approximately $2 million on you. Approximately. Do, do the calculation. Do, do each class and the time and everything. Never. How can you sell yourself? You're a $2 million product is what you are. So for young scholars here, remember that number. <laughs> don't, don't, yeah, you, do, you do your calculation. You do your calculation. Thank you so much, Dr. Guani. <laughs> Let's see, there's one more question there in the chat box. So uh, it's asked about by Sumiji, uh, one of our uh, PhD students here, who's already got a postdoc job. So why are hiring pre-doc RAs? What should be the key points to consider as an interviewer? Oh, that's a fantastic question because we are in the, uh, we are in the postdoc market as well. And, and so, I want to know what, what cutting edge uh, questions you're asking and what cutting edge technology in terms of data analysis you're bringing to bear. Two questions and, and, and uh, I will have a very good view of, of uh, where, and, and you know, it's the, it's the, sorry to use this word, but the fit is also important because we already have a, a, a good group here which is doing research in these areas, so obviously we are looking for somebody to kind of take that, you know, add add big value to that research. So we may not be, you know, you may be a great pre-doc, uh, oh, this is a pre-doc uh, question, not a post-doc question. Um, I, I would say for pre-doc RAs, the work ethic, that's it. The work ethic, the amount of work you are going to do is the main thing. Uh, Alok already told you that, uh, you know, we both value work ethic and we've lived that life. Uh, and so for, for me, it's all work ethic. It's, 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 it's a very important aspect of, uh, you know, being in this academic area. So anyway, we have two more minutes before we go to the concluding thing. And then uh, we have a seminar coming up, Jinjing too, right? In a while. Yeah. We need to so, uh, Prakash, do you have any fi final question from the chat? Uh, I haven't seen any. There was there was one quick question. If I could add to that, it is it is it is Shankar's question. The second part of it, which was, how do you do admin and keep up with your teaching and research responsibilities? The answer to the question is I cannot, and I'm struggling with this. So I thought when I got when I when I got my chair job, that that everything is second to my research, and I need my 40 hours a week, and then the rest come in. So now it's down to 20 20 hours a week, and uh, and and unlike the old days, I cannot stay up till four o'clock anymore. But uh, it's a tough, it's a tough one. So you've got to prioritize these things and, and, and find a way to do it. Get co-authors, I guess. <laughs> yeah, on that uh, note, uh, thank you, uh, Kishore. And I just like to invite uh, Saki for the final note, but before I do that, let me go ahead and acknowledge the, uh, so that Kishore, you know, uh, this is a quite uh, international, kind of crowd here. Uh, there's a, a HBR consortium has a committee meeting, uh, committee, and uh, Sakiv is the chair of it. And you have Sakiv uh, Mahmoud and Samrat Kumar Mandilu is the general secretary. Uh, Samrat Kumar is the vice uh, chair. Disa Shinde is a treasurer and there are several members like Prakash Adhikari, Jinjing Wang, Vinish Trest, Shoban Ilmaz, Somaj Chakravarti, Taneswar, uh, Rahman, and we are uh, advisory, uh, all advisors are uh, attending, uh, Keshav Vardrai Professor and Professor Emeritus Mukti and myself. 
So I think uh, we all, uh, I mean, this crowd aside, uh, other than me, played a very important role in terms of, you know, getting this done, you know, organizing this. So thank you very much to Mandy, you know, putting together all the technicalities, communication, organizing website, are fantastic. And so much it has become a great graphic designer for us. So all the uh, pretty thing you see in LinkedIn, that's him. So with that, um, uh, Sakib, go ahead and a couple of minutes, just kind of a, um, wrap it up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Bora. And, uh, you know, I want to thank uh, profusely to Professor Gawande. Uh, it was wonderful, you know, like fascinating actually for uh, young scholars like us. Um, and um, I will just reiterate what uh, Pukarji was mentioning. Uh, I wish I had uh, this talk, uh, you know, you know, when I started my academic career as an assistant professor, but it's uh, definitely, um, you know, um, you know, we can see like there is a um, no, you know, stop like where we can, you know, stop button. We can still learn every day, right? And um, I want to take uh, two takeaways that uh, you mentioned, like uh, don't sell yourself short. That's really I like that, you know, and uh, find your equilibrium. That's another one. I think for um, for young scholars, this is very important. Uh, and uh, you meant you talked it touched based on uh, the brand and uh, image and all those things and also the research the cutting edge research that we can focus as young scholars like if we're interdisciplinary um, research we want to do what areas we want uh, want to uh, focus you know the, to excel and try to make sure we can um, uh, make progress accordingly. So uh, anyway, Professor Gwande, I don't want to take much time here, but it is uh, wonderful. And I want to thank everybody, and also not only um, you know, your, for your uh, fascinating talk, and also uh, the, uh, the person who are, uh, worked behind the scenes to make sure that uh, we have this uh, talk, uh, you know, opportunity to hear from you. So thank you, Professor Gwande, for your time. And we want to have you again, and I can see that. Uh, not only at our H HPRC consortium events in the future, but also, um, you know, um, you know, again, maybe for a talk or something, and or want to know more about your research. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. I, I have a paper testing protests. Okay, so. <laughs> that'll be wonderful. Um, <clears throat> is there any uh, from the? Uh, is there any final thought from anybody before I formally close it? Uh, we just want to thank Professor Gowande one more time. Thank you so very much. This is super inspiring. We want to hear you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Fantastic. And um, 